All right, welcome to Bringing Process Integrity to the Manufacturing Plant Floor, hosted by Clarity and Belta Technology. Uh, we're excited to be with everyone today, and uh, I'm going to pass this over to John Parmley from Clarity to introduce himself and uh, give a brief overview for Clarity. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is John Parmley. I'm the GM for the Americas for Clarity. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're very happy to have everybody here today attending this, uh, this webinar. <clears throat> For those that aren't familiar with who Clarity is, Clarity is a, a, a leading provider of cybersecurity solutions purpose-built for OT. Uh, and we'll get into uh, the discussion a little bit later today, but uh, as everybody knows from reading the headlines, um, you know, uh, critical infrastructure security, OT security is, uh, is something front and center uh, these days as you read the headlines, as we talk to large enterprise customers uh, and prospects. And with that, um, you know, we're playing a major role with our with our partner Velta Technologies, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, to Jim Clark. Hi, uh, good afternoon or morning, wherever you might be. Thanks for joining. I'm Jim Cook. Uh, I'm responsible for delivering of the services uh, uh, that Velta provides. My background actually is from the CIO side. You'll see the guys to the uh, right of me there in the picture um, uh, have a, a different. Uh, uh, skill set and depth. I, I come from the IT side, former CIO of consumer goods manufacturing, supply chain, distribution, retail, and even some healthcare. And started back in the uh, days of the big six, if there's six left, but uh, uh, working for years in there. So um, I, I started on with the advisory board uh, as Velta has continued to grow, have joined into a full-time role here, and uh, am excited about uh, the work that we're doing and partners uh, like Clarity that we uh, do that work with. And with that, I'll hand it off to the other Jim. Ah, perfect. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so I'm Jim Flutterjohn. I oversee the sales and business development here at Velta. Um, as Jim said, his background's more on the IT side. Uh, my whole career has kind of been on the OT side of the business, helping customers lay out their digital transformation strategies uh, as they're connecting all these smart assets and making that data more actionable, how they do that in a secure way. Um, it's been about uh, three years or so with the Cisco teams, trying to teach the Cisco IT teams how to take everything in the OT side of the business. Uh, also spent about 10 years with Rockwell Automation. Uh, the last five of those is the global account manager for the Anheuser-Busch InBev business, helping them kind of lay out their factories of the future for their 250 breweries around the world. And then spent about 13 years with uh, Siemens Energy and Automation. So as Jim said, you know, my whole career has kind of been more on the OT side, uh, which really plays into what we're going to be talking about here today on how do we help customers with asset visibility, industrial cybersecurity, and what we also call digital safety in the industrial space. Dino? Thanks, Jim. So my name is Dino Busalaki. I'm the CTO for Velta Technology. Uh, I've been with Velta for three years now. Prior to working for Velta, I worked for Rockwell Automation, the network security services group uh, covering the central United States, providing services and solutions from a Rockwell perspective in the OT space on the industrial world. Uh, prior to that, I worked for a system integrator. Um, it's part of the Rockwell uh, channel. And prior to that, I spent 20 years working in engineering for a very large food and beverage manufacturer. And prior to that, I worked for various manufacturers, automotive, chemical, ag. So I basically have 40 years working in, in the industrial arena, specifically around technology and infrastructure um, in this space. So. Um, you know, and Velta is, consists, as you can see, part of our team is a multidisciplinary group um, with skills from IT, engineering, professional services, you know, driving into what we want to call this uh, industrial cybersecurity space. So that's that's really what Velta is, is made up of as a group, as, as a system integrator, if you will, but focused in the cybersecurity realm and OT platforms like Clarity is, is, is what our charge is. Terrific. Thank you guys for the, the intros. So you'll see on the screen, we're, we're going to cover several topics today from supply chains to the vulnerabilities that are hidden that you may not be aware of on the, the plant floor and the supply chain. Talk about your third party suppliers, um, you know, your risk, enterprise security, process integrity. 
We'll do a QA. So if you'll notice there is a chat on the on the right should be the right side of your screen and please put in any questions as we're going through this. If, if you would like to make sure we address before we're through today, we'll make sure and answer any questions you have and then we'll do a brief wrap up. So we're going to move into the 1st topic. Um, which is supply chain. So, Dina, would you kick this off and give us your kind of your definition of supply chain? So we're all thinking of it in the, in a similar way. Yeah, sure. So, you know, the most fundamental level of the supply chain is the management of flow and goods and data and finances related to products or services from procurement to raw materials to delivery of the product to its final destination, right? And what everybody's been trying to accomplish in this arena is end to end visibility across the supply chain, right? From suppliers through customers, you know, with the mind and goal of improved supply chain resiliency, right? And in this past year, you know, we've seen a lot of disruption to the supply chain, whether it was from shipping bottlenecks or, you know, the one right now, you can see the semiconductor shortages are going on where you got many manu automotive manufacturers are actually stopping production because they don't have the chipsets that they need. And, and others are going to follow here pretty soon uh, behind them as far as not having the materials that they need to be able to um, make their product. And, you know, and, and other guys, and you'll hear this throughout the, the, the conversation around digital transformation and industry 4.0 initiatives and the increasing connectivity throughout this environment, right? Automating manual processes and, you know, exposing and what it's doing is it's exposing the risk to the supply chain, right? So if you go back just a few short years ago and look what happened in 2017 to Maserick, you know, it was really hit by the not pet yet. Uh, uh, disk wiping, you know, cyber weapon that the Russian military had, had developed with help from the NSA from their internal blue hacking tool, you know, which was the same exploit for WannaCry, impacting over 50,000 of their endpoints, right? A thousand servers, 600 sites, 130 countries, $300 million in losses just for them, not including what happened to their supply chain of all the people that were sitting there waiting for product to be received from this, you know, the shipping magnet that wasn't able to, to move their uh, containers or their ships, right? It just created a huge cyber event and it was very disruptive in that environment. So, you know, and, and if you look at today's newsworthy stories around uh, Colonial Pipeline and, JV, and JBS and the supply chain disruption to them, you know, they made it all the way down to the consumer level, right? And as we've heard throughout the, um, the discussion that it was an IT attack, right? You know, it's really hard to tell the difference between IT and OT in, in some cases because of industry 4.0 and digital transformation. Because if the attack vector was Microsoft, well, OT systems use Microsoft, right? The HMIs, the engineering workstations, the application servers that they write, write on, historians, are all part of that same vector. So is that an IT asset or is that an OT asset? So when I hear that IT and it didn't impact OT, well, it had to impact OT because they shut down production and you have IT assets in that environment, including networking components also. So um, when you think about this, that general sense, cybersecurity, you know, is being, being attacked in this in this space impacts your supply chain, right? It's like a, it's like a rock being thrown into a quiet, you know, pond. It just ripples out and hits, you know, all the vectors throughout the environment. Any, uh, Jim, Jim, John, anything to add? No, I, I think. Oh, go ahead, John. No, no. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the challenges that we're facing as a industry is really all about ownership and accountability. Um, you know, whether we talk about, um, you know, who owns the manufacturing shop floor, uh, who owns the technology in that environment who owns the integration and who is accountable for the integration when you converge IT and OT. And, and I think one of the struggles that, um, you know, that, that I see in regards to execution and whether it's talking about third party suppliers or it's talking about what's in the infrastructure now um, is, is I think there really needs to be some level of heart to heart conversation at the executive level within these organizations, as well as at the, uh, at the plant level in regards to accountability and ownership. And I think those hard decisions and hard conversations probably haven't been met, you know, in a lot of organizations maybe haven't happened yet. Um, you know, I, I would, would love to hear other people's kind of feedback or opinions on that. 
Yeah, I would I would agree 100%, John. I mean, and we'll we'll kind of talk through that a little bit later around the the whole thing around lack of urgency and ownership and and how how can companies get started on this because it it does tend to be such a big topic that tends to be more of a boil the ocean and I don't know where to begin, so I don't kind of conversation. And you know, to Dino's point, it it is interesting when we hear conversations around you know, hey, this was an IT attack. Why is it get, keep getting promoted as an OT concern? And we're hearing more and more customers talk about when the IT person goes to that person who oversees the OT side and asks the question, hey, can you give me some degree of confidence that we're safe to run our production environment? Nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, the answer is we don't have that visibility. So if you can't if you can't guarantee we can run that safely we have to shut down right and so being able to to provide that level of confidence with some type of metric or something like that i think is going to become more and more critical for those ot stakeholders to be and the it it's an enterprise-wide conversation to be able to make them feel comfortable that they can continue to run safely even when they have an it uh, originated attack I don't know if anybody has any other uh, any other comments on that. Otherwise, I'll I'll speak to uh, third party suppliers a little bit. I say go for it, John. Okay. So so you know the the third party supplier question is you know I think dovetails into what we're talking about in regards to accountability and ownership. Um, in a lot of cases, what we're seeing is that there's two aspects of third party supplier uh, challenges. Uh, related to the OT or critical infrastructure space. Uh, one, I think, is just the nature of third party suppliers in giving them access to your critical infrastructure in the OT environment. Uh, and, and that revolves around what I would call kind of the legal requirements and some of the operational requirements in handing over some of your critical infrastructure to third party suppliers. And third party supplier might be something as simple as a ICS vendor gaining access to, you know, hardware in your environment and how that access and what role or responsibility that supplier or that ICS vendor plays in maintaining their equipment in your environment. And who owns the responsibility of those updates, upgrades, when do they occur and everything else when it comes to third party suppliers. So there's that aspect of the risk variable when it comes to third party suppliers, but then there's the other component, which is a technology component. So we can talk about, you know, kind of people processes and technology and there's a people and process component of third party suppliers. But then there's also a technology component of giving access to these third party suppliers and what controls you have from a technology perspective with the software or hardware that you're using or third party suppliers are demanding to gain access to your organization and environment. So you really need to approach, I believe, the third party supplier question with kind of two parallel paths. One is a, uh, for lack of a better description, a paperwork path, a responsibility and accountability path. That paperwork path uh, impacts everything from, uh, if something happens, what does your insurance policy say? If something happens, what potential regulatory requirements did you just uh, involuntarily breach. So there's that component and then there's the other component that says, okay, I have remote access software in my environment. That remote access software is being pushed to me by maybe one of the ICS vendors. Uh, that remote access technology might or might not quote unquote void warranties when it comes to your ICS vendors. And that technology and the pressure are surrounding that technology is also related to what is your IT security organization saying about this remote access technology. 
So a lot of organizations will look and go, okay, well, we, we're going to enable third-party suppliers through VPN. Might be IPsec tunneling, could be RDP, could be remote desktop. There's a lot of different technology, and if you aren't putting controls in analyzing that remote access technology from a OT-specific view, what you're going to do is you're going to risk either your manufacturing plant going down or a disruption in your lines, and that's critical as well. So again, I think we need to come back to who's responsible from an accountability perspective when it comes to not only technology in the environment, but also the, uh, you know, kind of the rules and regulations of the road when it comes to enabling third-party suppliers in your environment. And, and, and again, I think that's what organizations need to reevaluate when it comes to third-party suppliers in enabling them in the environment. Um, you know, with that, I think, uh, you know, what's critical there is, are you exposing yourself from a potential liability perspective when it comes to enabling these third-party suppliers and what does that risk or exposure look like from, also, from a compliance perspective as well as if you have an insurance policy perspective. So, um, you know, that's what we're seeing uh, from a best practices perspective. We're seeing enterprises that are taking a leadership role look at it in a multifaceted perspective as opposed to just a tactical, hey, we need to give this guy access to a, our ICS environment to do an update today. It's, it's, you, you can't live and breathe a critical manufacturing environment like that, as an example. Yeah, I would add, uh, I just, everybody wants in, that's the trend, right? <laughs> We're not stopping it. Uh, we've got remote workers all over the place. You've got uh, your third party integrators that you need to come in and, and fix things. Uh, your OEMs are out there doing predictive analytics, uh, digital uh, industry 4.0 is coming down. Everybody wants in. And uh, we've got a lot of third parties coming in and you got to have a strategy and a plan on how you're going to manage that because uh, for everyone that wants in, you can't have a one-off uh, connection because then that just increases, uh, it, it increases your risk. Yeah, I, I think the other thing, Jim, is that what we're seeing is we're seeing some of these third-party suppliers put pressure and demands uh, at the manufacturing plant level. And, you know, my personal belief is that you can't have third-party suppliers dictate how they reach their equipment in a one-off way. You have to have some uniformity, and I would strongly encourage, you know, o you know, critical infrastructure owners to push back on their suppliers as it relates to how they access critical, you know, crit critical data, critical equipment in the environment. Um, be because if you have, you know, anywhere from five to twenty to to fifty different vendors coming into your environment. You can't have five to 15 to 50 different remote access solutions. It, it just increases the attack surface and increases the risk on your organization. And, you know, you, you got to push back. Right. Well, I take that a step further too, John. I mean, as, as we've had conversations or, or in my past career around digital transformation industry 4.0, you know, one of the questions I, I would get asked a lot around third party supplier access is, any tools out there that that give me any ability to audit what's going on versus just, you know, hey, here's a VPN and oh, by the way, they can access it anytime they want to because they've got the, the VPN access. Yeah, you know, a lot of it is how do I put together maybe an audit stra uh, strategy? How do I put in a strategy that allows me to, to see what the person is doing? And if I don't like it, I can control <laughs> them to leave that environment. Right, those those kinds of things five years ago didn't exist, so everyone just kind of was satisfied or just kind of dealt with what was available back then. And and in this day and age, you can't do that. To your point, you need to have an integrated platform that can give you all those different functionalities with audit trail and being able to control who has access to what. And if you don't like it, be able to hit that that red button and kick them out or whatever. So. I think that's really critical as people are thinking about what's what's possible when it comes to third-party supplier access. 
Yeah, and, and I think the other thing, uh, you know, and you brought it up, besides access, I think one of the things that's critical is that, um, you know, the requirements for remote access in these environments is different than the requirements for remote access in a traditional IT and carpeted area. And not only are the requirements different, but the environment is different and that different environment lends itself to why the OT security stack is so immature and the IT security stack is so mature is because of the complexities in these OT environments that is, you know, simply misunderstood with traditional IT professionals. Right. And as a former traditional IT professional, I, <laughs> Sorry, Jim. I, I, I concur. You are correct. I, I, I misunderstood for most of my career. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have to do the Jim and Jim show, the IT OT <laughs> conversation. So that's a good segue into, I guess, common overlooked vulnerabilities. I know we've touched on some of them, but but Jim Flutterjohn, you want to take a lead on this one? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just going to go through some of these, you know, that we see at a high level, um, and then if we want, we can dive deeper into it when we get into the Q and A section. But you know, when we talk about what are some of the common overlooked vulnerabilities that we see as we're kind of helping a customer walk through this, let's call it digital safety journey. Um, one of the top ones that we see, and, and some of these should not come as a surprise, is a really around things like unsecured protocols, right? Like if we, if we talk about one that we have seen over and over and over again is SMB version one, right? For people who are on the call who are not familiar with what that is, that's the common way that traditional ransomwares will come into an environment. Now, you would think, hey, my IT group is, is on board. They've already got a lot of those things taken care of on the IT side. But as Dino mentioned earlier, on, on the OT side and in the industrial space, SCADAs, HMIs, these IT assets that are part of that OT environment might be having Windows 7, Windows 95, you know, some of these older operating systems that never had the SMB version one turned off. So one of the things that we find when we go through this process is, is really how do we identify assets that are sitting out there that have some of these unsecured protocols. Um, another one of the, the top ones that we see a lot is really around what I'll call ghost or rogue assets. Right? When we talk about what ghost and rogue assets are, is there a PLC or an HMI or some industrial smart device that has Ethernet connectivity that's talking out to something on the Internet? Maybe that person on the Internet's not responding, but we're able to be able to show that visibility that this asset or this set of assets is trying to communicate with something outside of your environment. Now. If that's talking to cloud, great, we can approve that. But a lot of times, if you don't know, then it, it becomes a challenge on how you develop a strategy around that. So being able to show with visibility of what those assets are talking to, that's huge when it comes to ghost and rogue assets. Um, another one, and we kind of touched a little bit on this on the last topic, is around kind of having that unaudible uh, remote access. Right. Again, you know, we, we really touched on this on the last topic, but a lot of times the traditional way that someone would get remote access is, hey, let me just give you VPN access. Then all of a sudden that person leaves, they're able to still get into the environment. Once they're in, a lot of times, again, nine times out of 10, they're able to get around to all the different assets that are sitting out in that industrial environment. How do you make sure that when you give somebody access, you're controlling what assets they have access to and the ability to then track what changes they're making to those assets. Um, another one that, that again is, is quite common that should not be a surprise is really around default and weak passwords. Again, covered really well a lot of times on the IT side, but when you have IT or OT assets that are sitting out there that are running old operating systems, um, PLCs a lot of times don't have password protection to get in and out. Um, if you guys remember when the, the situation happened with Colonial Pipeline, the big thing that happened with Colonial was a very simple VPN password. 
It was a weak password that gave them remote access into that environment. So that's that's another area again that, that when we do our assessments or our visibility studies, we'll put together an observation letter that shows are you hit with some of these commonly overlooked vulnerabilities? Um, the other thing I'll, I'll say that we've really found that sometimes doesn't get talked a lot about when we talk about digital safety or, or cybersecurity, it's always around external people getting into my environment. Um, we're starting to see a lot more impacts when we're talking about in enterprise wide cybersecurity type of issues of internal threats as much as external threats, right? And what does that mean? We we worked with one uh, steel customer where IT ended up pushing a patch down that was pushed down to the IT assets on the plant floor and ended up causing a major down uh, outage on their industrial environment that they had no idea. They were going to chalk it up to kind of the ghost in the machine because they weren't able to see what exactly happened. Um, fortunately, they had a platform in place that gave them that continuous monitoring environment, and we were able to see, oh, that came from this environment, and here's how it moved. We were able to help them minimize that downtime outage by being able to show that visibility. But again, Overlooked vulnerability, let's not forget about the fact that sometimes it's internal versus external threats. Uh, anyone have anything to add around some of those overlooked vulnerabilities? You know, I'm, I'm just to add uh, one real quick, and I'll let you go, Dina. I just want everyone, we talk, some of those are commonly overlooked vulnerabilities. One in general is that most of these exploits are using previously published vulnerabilities, right? So if you're not managing that, you're, you're opening yourself up. It, 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 all these attacks are using previously published vulnerabilities. So you, that, that's a great place to start to say, what do we, what are we vulnerable for? How old is it? How long has it been out there? How critical it is? Sorry, Dino, go ahead. Well, mine goes back to the third party piece. I mean, I've witnessed where a lot of organizations, even it, to me, it's internal where they've outsourced their infrastructure support to some third party organization who really doesn't have any knowledge of the fact that there's control systems maybe connected to the network that's being managed by this third party in another part of the world, for example. And if they want to boot a switch in the middle of the day, they'll just do it because they want to put a patch on it, not realizing that I've got process areas that run through that switch that rely on that connectivity. And even though it's a 30 second outage, it's enough to shut down those process areas, which are very costly and very expensive. So in that particular scenario, we have a third party who has responsibility for supporting the network, internal if you want to call it that, hired by IT to manage that environment. But because of the digital transformation and the industry 4.0 initiatives, things have gotten connected to a network or too close to an IT network that rely on process to process area connectivity. And now you've got a critical component in the middle that's at the, thing, at the control of somebody else who has no idea about your production schedules or your priorities in that area. If they want to boot a switch in the middle of the day because they think they can get away with it for 30 seconds, all of a sudden I got a four hour downtime window I have to experience and that just cost me $300,000. Mm -hmm. We've seen that stuff, right? And so how do you verify that, right? And these tools that we're talking about here are great referees for the OT guys to recognize what is impacting their environment, what is being disruptive to them, the things that they're not seeing. Well, I, I, I think, I, oh, go ahead, John. Uh, I think there's one other thing to bring up here, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is when we talk about common, you know, <clears throat> overlooked vulnerabilities, I think the big challenge is how do you uh, expose yourself to those commonly overlooked vulnerabilities and what you do with them, right? And, and, and at the end of the day, I, I think the, the, the challenge is if you don't have complete access and understanding of the assets in your environment, this whole concept of overlooked vulnerabilities and just vulnerabilities in general is something that's a blind spot for most organizations. And, yeah. you know, I think that's really the struggle. We can talk about vulnerabilities, but it, but at the other, you know, whether they're common vulner, overlooked vulnerabilities or, uh, uh, you know, uncommon overlooked vulnerabilities or vulnerabilities that you know that you're just ignoring and aren't overlooked, right? At the end of the day, if you don't have a really good understanding of the assets in your environment, 
And that's a pretty complicated process to do, right? If you don't have a good understanding of the assets in your environment, the whole concept of vulnerabilities breaks down. And, and I think that's uh, an area that I believe organizations really need to focus in on is if they don't get really good at understanding the in, in exploring and inventorying the assets in your environment, uh, that's the weak spot. That's the blind spot because you can't get to vulnerabilities unless you know what assets you have in your environment. And I think I'd take that a step further, John. You know, in, in the past, there's kind of a cultural change that's been going on. In the past, around visibility that you're talking about, a lot of these companies would just do a network assessment. And they might do it once every year, once every two years, and think, okay, I've, I've got my visibility, and I can build my strategy around that. And the answer is no. I mean, it... In this day and age around having platforms that do continuous monitoring 24-7 of those assets is critical. What happens when, you know, your phone ends up on the industrial wireless network or an iPad or some other device that just pops in and out of the network? That would have never been captured in the past. So to your point, culturally, I think customers need to understand that it, having that continuous monitoring platform in place is going to be part of their overall strategy versus the old way of doing things with network assessments. So that is a great segue over to Jim Cook. Uh, if we talk about how you evaluate risk, what are some ways, smart ways to do that? I like the uh, graphic there with the dial. I wish we could just turn down our, it was as simple as turning down our risk to medium. We'll go to medium on this. Uh, um, you know, the one thing I, I always try and stress as, as I said before, I, I was one of those from the IT side that didn't see those things. I consider myself a, uh, an ex-smoker type of approach, right? Where they're just, you just hate smoking because I used to do, I, I, this stuff uh, really gets to me because I used to be the <laughs> one that didn't take the proper look at this thing. And, and, and what, what I try and explain is, you know, the impact of these OT systems to the physical world just can't be under, understated, right? It, it's no longer digital systems uh, with di digital outcomes, right? And that was my life. That was the OT life, IT life. And, and now it's these digital systems to the physical outcomes, right? And so as we talk about the IT, OT convergence in these networks and are getting interconnected and uh, and we've got to understand the risk. It's a three-legged stool from my uh, belief where we've got the IT side that's learning more about the OT. OT needs to learn about, you know, what those risks are. But there's the, the, the business risk manager that sits up on top. That Who owns that? Sometimes it's a CFO. Sometimes they actually have a risk officer. Is it your CISO? Is it just a security officer? Is it, is it land in the CEO, the CEO space? But Ultimately, the risk is a business issue, and you need to step back and, and, and manage it like an enterprise risk management program, because that's where it kind of gets lost up to that executive level, that leadership level, the ones that have the budget um, that are trying to decide, well, what do I do? I mean, I've talked to so many CFOs who, you know, that, that are responsible, the, the C-suites that are responsible for the risk. And I go, Jim, you know, uh, my my IT guy or my cybersecurity guy starts talking to me. And after 30 seconds, I, I just ask him, well, how much is this going to cost? Right. They don't understand what the true risk is and the language isn't the same. But you you got to bring it back to that business issue and in in evaluating. So what are those consequences, the scenarios and the impact as opposed to, you know, uh, you know, sometimes complicating the issue with uh, the technologies. But what's what's that business? And, and, and then start putting things in place that you can evaluate or evaluate and address risk, right? So how do you mitigate it? What are my fix options? Are the compensating controls? Do I just accept the risk, right? And you have to approach that from the, those are risk management principles. So it, it used to be, and this is, I, I bought cybersecurity 15 years ago uh, or more. And I thought, wow, this is cheap, right? <laughs> this is cheap. Well, it's not, it's not cheap. We know where the trend is going, but 
it, it was sort of this vicious cycle. It was easy just to transfer my risk to the cyber insurance when it first came out because it was cheap and go, well, I, why should I do anything if something bad happens, it'll pay out. Well, that's not the way the trend is going, right? So cyber insurance is changing. Uh, do you know the, the the premiums are increasing? The, the limitations are coming in, and the, the physical exposures are out there, and so the, the cycle's going on. But it's it's getting close to breaking, and and we're working with uh, insurance industry uh, experts really to to get a better handle on this um, because it's all interrelated. It's all interrelated because if we're if we're addressing cybersecurity as a risk, it's a business issue. Where does that play in? And, and where do we need to protect? And when you get to the physical side, the game's different. The game's different because the goal is about the resiliency for the business, not just data protection anymore. I don't know if anybody, uh, uh, John, if you had something to add, or Jim, or Dino. Yeah, I think just from my perspective, Jim, you know, we've we've talked a lot about this with various customers. That, Cybersecurity and and the risk factor it's 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 amazing, but it's driven so much by company culture. What is that company culture? What will I allow someone to do in my environment or not do in my environment? And that that's that's why sometimes this this evaluation of risk can sometimes be difficult because every customer you can't just say here's here's a cybersecurity strategy that's going to work for everybody because everyone's culture is very different. Well, let's debunking the myths versus the facts, right? Those who would still say, well, we're air gap, we're not connected, right? And and what we always find when we go out and, and, and do the work that we do as practitioners in this space, that's never the case, right? The connectivity exists in the OT environment. It comes in a lot of different ways, it's got all those form factors. And if you don't have visibility into it, then you're just vulnerable. You know, you're, you're wide open. It's like leaving your doors and windows unlocked, you know, no gates, no, no lights, no cameras, no dogs, no bars, you're just wide open, you know, and, and, and the people that are responsible for those assets are not the IT professionals and they'll point their finger and say, cybersecurity, that belongs to IT. That's not my problem. But that's why we, we look at it differently as a digital safety, because safety is everybody's responsibility. There's no question about that, right? Number one priority in any manufacturing environment you go, critical infrastructure, transportation, airport, take your pick. Safety is the number one priority. Number two, unplanned, unscheduled downtime, reducing that. So the question is, is how do you make these physical outcome producing kinetic systems digitally safe? And that's the way that this message is going to be driven at some point in time is how safe am I? So. This rolls to me, right? Enterprise security. Yeah, it sure does. It does. Yeah. You segue it to yourself. They're very good, right? So, you know, and think about it, right? So do you really put the same emphasis and due diligence into OT security as you do for your enterprise security? I mean, that's a question you need to ask yourself. You know the answer, right? You think about the skills, the resources, the, the partner relationships you have with the technology partners, all the work that you do to develop your enterprise security. Do you honestly believe that you're doing the same thing on the platform? Right. You know, if, if you were to ask this question to a CISO or a CIO, what is your role or responsibility in regards to cybersecurity for industrial control systems? And what kind of answer would you expect to get from them? And at the same time, go ask the OT professional that actually owns the plant floor that's responsible for that area. What, what response would you get from them? Right. And so in that in that context, it's like, what is it going to take? And whose responsibility is it, right? We've talked about the risk, you know, we've talked about the strategy, we've talked about the supply chain. Now the question is, is what are we doing about it, right? Who's gonna be assigned the job and the, of going out there and determining what's going on? We, we, you know, Clary's got a, a great uh, video that they, that they present with one of the pharmaceutical manufacturers, a customer of theirs, and it took the engineering manager to call the CISO up and say, look, we have a problem and you and I need to solve it together. In order to, to get that person to come visit, that CISO to come visit that engineering team and walk to the plan and open up those panels and show those control systems out there and say, I'm talking about securing this stuff. Right? How do we do that together? Help me determine what the steps are that I need to take. How am I gonna get my budget put together? What kind of people should I be looking for? What vendors should I be looking at? And get their help, right? And that's the kind of conversation needs to be had on. If you're an IT professional and you think you've got this, 
you're wrong. You're going to miss it by a lot. Right? You're not doing your organization any service at all if you just think that you can put a firewall in and call it a day. Because right? those control systems, they leak all around out there. You're, you're, they got multiple network cards out there. You won't even see, you know, two thirds of the network and the assets that are out there, and they're in complete control of them. You know, you have no visibility into these networks and these assets that they have if they put, you know, other Ethernet cards in their PLCs or other network cards in their PLCs. It becomes invisible to you, right? They got cellular out there. They got Wi-Fi out there. They got Bluetooth out there. They got multiple networks that they've done, and you you don't have any visibility into them at all. Again, who's responsible? Who does it fall back to, right? And if you look at your organization, map it out. You know, when's the first time OT and IT have the same common manager? Is it at the CEO? Is that where it's at? Because if it's all the way up there, that's a bad spot to be to go have this conversation. But Maybe that's where the responsibility needs to lie is at that CEO level. Jim, John? I, I, I think it, as I look at it and as I talk to organizations, you know, the visibility and complexity in these industrial control environments is something that simply is a bit misunderstood from an IT perspective. And there's, you know, there's no reason to point fingers. It's an educational issue, right? And, and, and you know, Jim, I think you could probably concur with that, right? Is that in a, in a traditional enterprise IT environment, it's a pretty homogenous environment. In a, in, and it's relatively new, right? I mean, you turn over laptops in your employees and you turn over, you know, servers in your environment maybe once every, I don't know, four, five, six years. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a pretty homogenous environment. In the industrial control space, it's very heterogeneous. The complexity and uh, in understanding of how these devices in the environment work, both from just a standalone perspective as well as how they communicate with other, um, you know, other aspects of the network, is very complicated. And as a result, there's two different languages that are spoken, one from an IT perspective, one from an OT perspective. And I would just strongly encourage anybody that's in the IT organization that's starting to take on responsibilities for OT, whether part of its digital transformation, part of its security, part of its in the application universe, uh, really get an understanding and spend time in the industrial controls space, right? In the, at a manufacturing plant, at a distribution center, whatever it might be, to understand truly the complexity of that environment and the nature of that environment. And I think then both organizations to, can come together, empathize with each other on really what needs to be done, both in an enterprise security perspective, as well as just from the industrial environment. Yeah, it, it's a great point, John, because I, uh, um, I always tell the story. I mean, until I start, started working with these guys, you know, setting uh, the the technology direction for worldwide companies, and it was it was decades before I I, I was out on the floor and I said, "What's in that green box over there?" <laughs> you know, before I looked into that, we we have been successfully migrating to the cloud, doing all these wonderful things and new ERPs. And I found that they opened it up, and I said, "No, no, close it. I, I don't want to see it. That, I got enough on my plate." <laughs> Plausible deniability. Right. Yeah, I do exactly. not want to know what's going on in that box because if I touch something, those guys over there are going to yell at me and tell me not I'd not to come out here anymore. And, and that's that's just the way it's evolved. But we can't we can't do that anymore. Yeah. We can see by the recent <laughs> events and the trends that are going. I, I, we can't do it anymore, and this is my ex-smoker uh, type of uh, reaction coming in, going, "Don't be old, Jim anymore." In this case, going, <laughs> "Yeah, you got to get out there. You got to understand it because these worlds are colliding." Yeah, yep, they are. So we're going to segue now uh, over to Jim Flutterjohn to just talk briefly about how you assure process integrity when you start implementing some of these digital safety, cybersecurity measures to protect yourself. Yeah, thanks, Larry, and. I know we're, we're getting towards the top of the hour. I want to leave a little bit of time for Q&A. But you know, process integrity is often one of those, those overlooked things when it comes to putting together an industrial asset visibility or a cybersecurity strategy. You know, process integrity really revolves around 
know, how do you take data from all these industrial assets or lines or areas and do something with that data, uh, especially if it has some impact on an event, right? It, it always is going to have an impact on certain KPIs in the industrial environment. For example, OEE, unscheduled downtime, things like that. I think people, when we talk about industrial cybersecurity and what does that mean, sometimes it gets really overlooked on how those types of platforms or strategies might have an impact on the overall production of the environment, right? If you, if you really talk about, and I mentioned this earlier when we were talking, when that IT guy has that event and goes to the OT guy and says, hey, can you guarantee with some degree of, of certainty that we can run that OT environment safely? That's part of that process integrity side of that conversation. It had nothing to do with the actual attack on the environment. It's how do we look at the OT side as a, a system and make sure that we are still running in a safe type environment. So process integrity spends a lot of time around that piece. And not being able to have that visibility it is costing customers a lot of money, whether they were actually attacked or not. Right, Dino mentioned Colonial, he mentioned JBS. Those were both environments where their business was hugely impacted on the OT side of things, which is that cash register that's actually making money for the company. They had to shut down, so there were huge impacts to that. So one of the things that when we look at how do we help a customer lay out this kind of digital safety strategy, Yes, we look at visibility of assets. Yes, we look at a cybersecurity piece, but cyber means a lot of different things to different people. It's that boil the ocean. Process integrity has to be one of those foundational things that we help customers look at as they're trying to figure out how do they ultimately build and execute that digital safety strategy. Dino, Jim, anyone want to add anything to that? Well, it goes to the triad, right? I mean, availability, right, is the OT guy's predominant, you know, priority. Then integrity, then confidentiality. We're in the IT world that, that, that priority is flipped. Where priority is number one. Then, then availability, then confidentiality. So, you know, I've heard, of, I've heard OT guys say security just gets in the way of getting things done. Anything that slows them down, they try to remove it because of, the lean practices that they have and the processes that they have and so few people that they have out there running these, these highly automated manufacturing environments, which, you know, is just littered with devices. I mean, it's a 15 to 21 ratio difference between the number of OT assets you'll find in an environment versus IT. And you'll have even less people managing that stuff. Mm -hmm. so, you know, it's really, you got to really look at the business as a whole and determine how are we going to get our arms around? You know, what is the best practice? How do you bring the IT guys in and get their skills and their expertise of standardizing, you know, getting into as much of a homogeneous environment as you can, you know, with certain tools and technologies? And then, you know, how can I cast a wider net in this space? You know, so it, it, it's something that, that the organization has to really look at hard and, and not just treat it as uh, cybersecurity insurance is going to cover it because pretty soon, that, that whole thing is going to change. The insurance industry, I think, is going to quit paying ransomware, maybe even take it off the table and start looking at business interruption and property destruction and liability as a different way of, of, of providing insurance versus giving you ransomware money that's, that, that the threat act, uh, actors are looking for to see what kind you have because they're, they're targeting. <laughs> Some people are saying they're actually targeting companies based on their cybersecurity insurance that they have. Right, right. So I know we have eight minutes left and there have been several questions that have come in. Uh, so I'm going to throw some of these out here. Uh, one of the most recent ones uh, came in was, you know, what are your thoughts on isolated packets of machines and control that are not connected to any network? Like they're always air gapped, but uh, you know, how, how do you, is it a matter of taking inventory to know about those assets? What's your thought on those, on that question? I'll let Dino probably good one to answer that one. Well, I don't believe anything's ever air gap. You know, you can, you can say that, but if I can walk into your plant with my laptop and plug into that machine center, then I'm connected to it, whether it's isolated from a networking perspective or not. If I go out there with a thumb drive and stick it in the USB port on that HMI or that PLC that's out there to, to get to it. So there's always access. 
right? And now you don't know what's going on inside that machine center. So if it's not connected to anything, the DOEM is allowed to show up, or even anybody for that matter that can go out there and connect to that, can bring whatever they want they wanted them into that space. So the most notorious ones was the whole Stuxnet thing that happened, you know, a dozen years ago, right? That was an isolated plant. That wasn't connected to anything, but how did they get it in there? Passing out thumb drives, the engineers and scientists who put it on their laptops and then went into the plant. So these isolated machines that, that we're talking about, they're not air gap. They're never air gap because somebody has access to them. Yeah, I'd add, has access to them. I, and I'd add to that that uh, this is where your risk place, you, you need to know those things exist. You need to have that inventory because how are you going to manage any of those risks uh, if you don't have inventory? So there's methods to get to that, to build that inventory so that you can attach, uh, attack it and address those as risk properly. How old are those machines? Where are they? Are they connected? Um, you know, what open vulnerabilities do I have? How am I addressing them? What's my mitigation? What's my compensating control? Am I going to fix any of it? Uh, because to Dino's point, that. this stuff can get, <laughs> there, there's ways in today's world. Well, people don't want to walk on the way out there either. Right? Why do I need to, if I can get to the machine without having to walk to, you know, a half hour to get to it, why not I just put something on there so I can look at it from my desk to eventually yeah. get there, you know? Yeah. Unless it's a nuclear power plant, you know, they are going to connect it up somehow, some way. They, they, they right. just work, even if it's wireless, you know. And then I've been on plant tours doing a gimbal walk and asking if they have wireless. And it's absolutely not. We don't have any wireless in here. And sure enough, you'd see one sitting there on top of one of the panels. You'd see a WAP up there. But what's that for? And the response is, well, you didn't see that. That's not connected to anything. Like, to well, I, think, I think the it whole deep... easy button to get the, yeah. the access to it. You know? Well, and I think I think part of it too is kind of debunking that air gap. I mean, you know, you and I have talked a, a lot about this. It, it, it really, when someone says they're air gapped, people just trust but never verify, and then it creates kind of that false sense of safety because they're like, oh, well, yeah, I've been told for years that we're air gapped. And one of the things that we look at when we help a customer lay out that strategy is that verification, trust but verify. Let's find out what's going on. We've never seen a customer who said they're air gapped where they're actually air gapped. Myth again, myth versus fact. Okay. okay. So another quick questions around, um, you know, we've there a couple questions around insurance. Like, what's you know how how are our insurance? How is insurance? And I know we touched on this briefly, and we're not in that space. But you know, any perspective you guys have on? I know you're involved a bit in helping to shape the industry a bit in that area, but who would like to touch I mean, on I mean, that? I mean, my only comments on insurance is that, you know, if you have health insurance, does that prevent you from getting sick? <laughs> you know, it, it, it doesn't. So insurance, is, insurance is really a, a good financial backstop, but the insurance companies are getting smarter. There's a lot more data that's being generated. So the actuarials, are getting more accurate and as the insurance industry um, you know participates in the risk equation as it relates to cyber risk and such um, you know insurance is going to get more expensive um, and it's going to cover less mm -hmm. right. um, hey. but it, but it is a you know it is a temp you know it is a backstop but that's really about all it is right now and that's not going to solve the uh, you know you know, solve the problem at hand. Right. And on the CFT side, with all the physical implications, uh, the exposure is just wider and wider. And cybersecurity was built for uh, you know, data theft and and hadn't really even taken in consideration what your exposure is on on the backside. Uh, I just look at uh, the colonial and the, the class action suit that's coming against it uh, for not having gas delivered. Right. That. You know what really did uh, whoever sold them the cyber insurance did they did they take that into account? No, they're probably thinking, oh, what happens if we lose some credit card numbers and some social security numbers, right? Mm -hmm. With someone who's interested in your perspective on the you know ranking the industries as far as the priority of attention in cybersecurity. Um, and they're interested in as your professional perspective, you know, they're all of the, all of the industries are important, but are there some that are, you know, in your professional opinion, how would you rank the industries in terms of cybersecurity and protection needing protection? 
I, you know, I, I can jump in here. I, I don't know if I'd rank the industries as much as I would rank the quality of best practices that I see across individual enterprises. Um, you know, we'll see some companies that, um, you know, that maybe would not be an industry everybody's familiar with. Let's say it's, you know, building products, um, you know, man you know, people that manufacture sheetrock as an example, or organizations that manage sheetrock. I've seen some of those companies uh, that excel at cybersecurity related to OT. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's because of the people. And, and, and to me, uh, it's, it's really about driving best practices from a leadership perspective more than it is kind of a commonality across industries. Although admittedly in the pharmaceutical and life sciences space, I think because of project warp speed and what was going on with COVID over the last, uh, you know, year or two years or so, that uh, we've seen a lot of really positive action as it relates to, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical life life sciences. Uh, we've seen a lot of positive action as it relates to uh, food, um, um, uh, food and beverage. Um, mm -hmm. So, so we are seeing there are some industries that I think are taking leadership positions. But, you know, to, to really break it down, honestly, I think it's the leadership of these organizations more than it is the industry itself. Anybody else got an opinion? Yeah, I mean, Go ahead, Jim. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I would, I would rank uh, similar. I don't know if it's industry to industry. Everybody uh, within their own industry should look at it and rank. Well, what are those approaches and practices that you that you need to take? And and really 1 first is our urgency. I say. Hey, let's <laughs> you got to realize the world now, especially if you've got these OT implications is a lot different. I mean, even from the IT side, the, the trends are irrefutable over the past couple of years. And, and you've got to decide then, you know, who's that responsibility and the ownership, uh, turn it into that business discussion and go, do we, are we really at risk out there? Are we, do we really at risk? Do we know what's out there? And then when you finally get to that question, you go, okay, do we really know or do we think we know? I, I've had many conversations where they're like, yeah, we talked about it and we think we're not at risk. Well, we'll prove it. That, I mean, <laughs> I, I, from my audit side, I would go, really? We think we made money last year? Well, I want to know, right? Yeah, the, the only thing I'd add there, Jim, is that I think there's when, when we talk about risk, there's a lot of different variables that go into risk, right? But as I talk to organizations and they try and evaluate, one is they think, okay, is our organization a target? That's one component of it. So if we're, we're if we're more of a target, then obviously there's a big implication. The other, there are there are some organizations that say, hey, I'm not concerned about whether I'm a target or not. What I'm concerned about is what is the business impact if I get hit by lightning. And and so the business impact is is one component of it. And some organizations are saying, hey, look, I don't believe I'm a target. I'm not going to worry about it from that perspective. But the business impact, if something did happen, would be like a meteor hitting the earth. Mm -hmm. and, and so for them, they're willing to make the commitment, whereas other organizations are going, you know what, uh, you, you know, there's probably minimal business risk, but I know I'm in a high target segment, so I'm going to take that initiative. Yeah, and I would challenge anyone that said, uh, I don't think I'm a target. Well, it, it doesn't matter anymore. There's so much collateral damage. You look yeah. at solar winds, look at that, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of companies, they weren't targets. But they yeah. got their collateral damage, so uh, they may not be targeting you, but if they can get to you and make some money off of it, they're coming. Yeah. Well, it's like the it's like the malware I mentioned earlier that hit mass right? That was that was targeted for Ukraine. The Russians did that to, to send that to Ukraine. So and it just like you said, collateral damage. You know, so you don't have to be a target to get hit. They just happen to be ones yeah. that were lucky enough to to get that into their environment, but it wasn't meant for them. So I just want to. Thank everybody for for joining us. We have all the the contact information up on the screen. If there, I know there were some other side conversations that were going on back and forth in the chat. Um, this is great. I'm you know happy that that folks were engaged and had questions. And um, feel free to reach out. You know we've got all the emails and websites and all that. Um, we're having a golf event actually um, in the St. Louis uh, area. 
say Charles, Missouri area, the 23rd. So if anyone here is, happens to be in that area and would like to join, uh, we're going to be having an event with Clarity there as well, playing some golf and getting out of the the one on one office isolation we've all been in. So thanks everyone so much and have a great rest of the day. And if you want to reach out to get started uh, with us, just just please get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.